Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Keep trying. Can you hear me? Good morning. I guess you can hear me now. Welcome to the Mercer Tate Lecture. Before I begin, why don't we settle into a few moments of silent reflection, please. Thank you. A special welcome to uh, the alumni, faculty, staff, and friends of Germantown Friends School for being here with us this morning. We're really happy to have you in the audience as well. So glad you all came. So our Mercer Tate lecture is in honor, this is the 25th annual Mercer Tate 1948 lecture. Mercer Tate was a lifer at GFS. He graduated in 48 and was a prominent public service, servant, excuse me. Among his many activities, Mercer was a democratic leader in the Ninth Ward in Philadelphia. He was president of the Fellowship Commission president of the United Neighbor Centers of America, and a delegate for the Pennsylvania Constitutional Convention, where he helped rewrite the state constitution. Mercer Tate also served uh, GFS in many ways as head of the Alumni Association, as a member of the school committee, and as a constant and dedicated volunteer. He devoted his life to public service, and he exemplified the kind of graduate that GFS seeks to produce. This lecture, the annual Mercer Tate Lecture, is held every year in his memory and features prominent speakers from various fields of public service. This year, we are particularly delighted to welcome back to GFS a graduate from the class of 2000, David Wade. Before David comes to the podium, I'd like to tell you a little bit about what he's been doing since 2000 in the 17 short years since he graduated GFS. David currently serves as the Director of, Public, of Policy and Planning for the Pennsylvania Office of Attorney General, where he oversees strategic planning, budgeting, and provides policy and communications counsel to Attorney General Josh Shapiro. He also represents the Attorney General on the Pennsylvania Commission on Crime and Delinquency. Before moving home to Pennsylvania, David lived in Mumbai, India, where he worked as a volunteer consultant for TechnoServe, an international nonprofit focused on identifying and implementing business solutions for poverty. David is also a veteran of the Obama for America campaign and the Obama White House. On the campaign, he was the point person for opposition research on Republican vice presidential nominee Sarah Palin and was part of the then Senator Joe Biden's debate prep team. In the White House, David served as assistant director 
and Deputy Director of Research of the Research Department, and as a Special Assistant to Deputy Senior Advisor Stephanie Cutter. David also was the Research Director for Senator, Senator Majority Leader Larry, um, Harry Reid, and a researcher for the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee during the 2006 election cycle when Democrats won back the House majority. David began his career in politics when he interned for Congressman John Lewis, a civil rights icon representing Georgia during his junior project. David earned his bachelor's degree in history and political science from Northwestern University in Evanston, Illinois, where he met his wife, Kim. Welcome, Kim. We're happy to have you here as well. They currently live in the Francisville neighborhood of Philadelphia. Please join me in welcoming back to Germantown Friends, David Wade. Thank you, Dana, for that kind introduction. It's truly an honor to be back here with all of you at GFS. The last time I was here, almost five years ago, was at my dad Dick's retirement celebration. That was a fantastic occasion, and I know that he was really looking forward to being back on campus and seeing so many friendly faces today. Unfortunately, he can't be here, but I know he and my mom are watching on the live stream. Hi, guys. <laughs> This community has given me so much. A fantastic education, wonderful mentors, like my junior project advisor, Ellie Elkington, who's here today, lifelong friends, and ongoing support as I've grown professionally. It helped me find my career path, but more importantly, GFS helped to teach me the values that brought me to public service. So it's with great and profound gratitude that I stand here today. Before I get started, I have to make a couple of quick notes. First, though I work for the Office of Attorney General, I'm speaking on my personal behalf today. Second, though I'm a staunch Democrat, my intent today is to refrain from partisanship. What I'm trying to impart is about my approach to public service, not my views on issues, though I'll reference those to help make my point. Third, you should know that my first paying job in politics lasted exactly one day. It's a bio point that doesn't often get mentioned, but it's important for you all to know because success always comes in fits and starts. As Dana mentioned, I've spent much of my career as a researcher. So I began preparing for today's talk the way any good researcher would, with a bit of Googling. I looked for source material to help me think through my approach to public service. I came across a lecture on Quakerism and politics that provides a relevant frame for me to explain some of the choices I've made and to help you all think about the choices that lie ahead. The lecture I found was given by a Swarthmore professor named Frederick Tolles. Tolles delivered it 61 years ago, but its themes remain relevant. By tracing the ways that Quakers engaged in politics in the public square over the centuries, Tolles identified two poles or strains of thinking in Quaker thought about how to engage in the political process. The first he identified as the absolutist pole, and the second, the relativist pole. The absolutist tradition can be seen in George Fox's call for Oliver Cromwell, the Lord Protector of England, to quote, lay down his crown at the feet of Jesus. To quote Tolles, Fox was a revolutionary. He had no patience with the relativities and compromises of political life. He was absolute in his beliefs, and in his Quaker witness. Many of the brightest chapters in Quakerism's history are rooted in this tradition, speaking truth to power and standing on principle no matter what. Like Lucretia Mott, a leading abolitionist and feminist in the 19th century, who advocated strongly against the 14th and 15th Amendments, which gave African American men the right to vote, but allowed women to continue to be excluded from this right. Or Steve Carey, a GFS alum and longtime leader of the American Friends Service Committee, 
who was part of a group of anti-war protesters who tried to prevent bombs from being loaded onto the USS Nitro, which was taking them to an, anti, to an aircraft carrier bound for Vietnam. The second poll, this relativist poll, was embraced by William Penn when he set up his holy experiment in Pennsylvania. From its founding in 1682 until 1756, Quakers dominated political life in the, com in the colony, running for and serving in elected office and administering local government. But the work of governance did require some compromise on the part of the Quakers, most notably when they were expected to send funds to support the British Empire's wars against Spain and France. Quaker leaders knew that if they didn't comply, they would lose control of the colony. As Tolles explained, they found dodges, like sending money as for the Queen's use, rather than explicitly for war. But compromises of their faith were made. In 19th century England, Quaker John Bright became an influential member of Parliament and ultimately a member of the Prime Minister's Cabinet. He fought for and succeeded in a number of areas that were aligned with his values. He fought to repeal the Corn Laws, which took food from the poor. He extended the right to vote, ended capital punishment, and sought justice and fairness for subjects of the British Empire in Ireland and India. Despite these many successes, he also supported policies that were not in keeping with his Quaker values. He compromised. In 1927, the Philadelphia Yearly Meeting explained this tradition well, writing that Quaker values could be advanced by those who devote themselves with unselfish public spirit to the building of a high moral character, excuse me, a high national character, and to the shaping of a righteous policy of government, both at home and abroad. Tolles reconciled these two positions by arguing that each needs the other. Quote, the relativist needs the absolutist to keep alive and clear the vision of the city of God while he struggles in some measure to realize it in the city of earth. And conversely, the absolutist needs the relativist, lest the vision remain the possession of a few only, untranslated into any degree of reality for the world as a whole." Unquote. This dynamic of the absolutist and the relativist working together, needing one another, is evident when we look at how change is made in our society. In most cases, the absolutists demand change from the outside, and the relativists in government find a way to enact it. In this broader sense, outside the Quaker tra tradition, I think the terms activist and pragmatist better explain these distinct approaches, so I'll use them going forward. In the 1960s, the Civil Rights Movement sounded a clarion call for freedom, which was met by President Johnson and members of Congress working to pass the Voting Rights Act and Civil Rights Act. Were the idealists satisfied? No. But the arc of the moral universe was bent towards justice. In the 1970s, environmentalists demanded industry clean up the damage that had been done to rivers and air. It took President Nixon and members of Congress to negotiate and pass the Environmental Policy Act, Clean Air Act, and Clean Water Act. The problem wasn't fixed, but we had powerful tools that gave Earth a chance. More recently, the expansion of LGBTQ rights succeeded because of this interplay. Activists pushing for equality now, and elected leaders like President Obama, and crucially, the Supreme Court, acting to put equality into action in marriage, in medical decisions, and in military service. To be sure, we're not all the way there yet. Under both federal and state law, there are still no protections for the LGBT, LGBTQ community in employment or public accommodations. So-called bathroom bills designed to limit rights are being pushed in state capitals across the country. But we move the cause of rights and justice forward. For change to happen, we need these two poles to stay in balance and work in a complementary fashion. But in today's politics, the traditional push and pull between activists and pragmatists has been disrupted. Due to a convergence of factors, including reliance on the internet and social media for news, gerrymandering, 
and the rise of super PACs and dark money, we've seen heightened partisanship in our electorate. According to a recent study from the Pew Research Center, the divide between Republicans and Democrats on key political values, like the role of government in addressing racism, our approach to immigration, and how best to address our national security challenges, is at the highest it's been since the survey began in 1994. What's more, the differences across party lines are far wider than the differences found across other, other div divisions in society, including gender, race, education, and religious observance. As a result of this increased partisanship, as well as the structural, structural factors mentioned previously, elected officials are more incentivized than they were previously to push to the extremes. In both major parties, ideological purity is now a goal that many politicians seek and that many in the electorate demand. This has re resulted in more elected officials who have traditionally taken on the pragmatist role becoming activists instead. The result is there are simply not enough pragmatists to, in office to get the job done. In both Washington and Harrisburg, the basic functions of government are too often not happening. Laws are not made, appointees are not confirmed, and budgets are not passed because there are too many elected leaders unwilling to engage in the hard work of compromise. For some, it may be due to electoral considerations. For others, it is deeply held principle, but the fact is, it's not working. And the more government does not work, the more emboldened the activists in each party become, demanding more purity, more partisanship, and extending this cycle further. During the 2012 election, President Obama argued that the Republican fever in the form of the Tea Party and staunch opposition to his policies would break after the election. He believed that once they didn't have to worry about beating him in the next election, they would turn to the task of governing. That's not how it played out. With control of government divided between the parties, which is historically an opportunity for bipartisan compromise, little legislation was passed, further fueling activist discontent on both sides of the political spectrum. In 2016, the activist wings of both parties became even stronger, manifesting themselves in Bernie Sanders' strong performance in the Democratic primary and Donald Trump's victories in the primary and general elections. The only way to change this dynamic is to return to valuing competence in government and to electing pragmatists to jobs that, are fun that fundamentally require pragmatism. There are still places outside of Washington where this tradition is alive and well, though they are fewer and further between. We need to hold them up as examples while they are still around. At GFS, I learned a lot about this absolutist and activist tradition, as I'm sure you have. I was inspired by the heroic figures that, embo that have embodied the best of this approach, both within the Quaker tradition and throughout our nation's history. But through the school's community to, com sorry, through the school's commitment to community service, civic activism, and the public sphere, I also learned the value embodied in the relativist or pragmatist approach. This lecture's namesake, Mercer Tate, was clearly a pragmatist. As a Democratic leader in the Ninth Ward and a delegate to the Pennsylvania Constitutional Convention, he found opportunities to make a profound impact on his community, his city, and his state. And like anyone in the arena, Tate was no doubt forced to compromise but he deemed it worthwhile when weighed against the good he could do. As Dana mentioned, I got my start in government and politics during my junior project. I was fortunate to have the opportunity, opportunity to intern on Capitol Hill for Congressman John Lewis, who is one of the few figures to succeed both as an activist and a pragmatist in one lifetime. In the 60s, Lewis had been a leader in the nonviolent struggle for civil rights. He was one of the key speakers and organizers of the March on Washington in 1963. He was brutally beaten leading a peaceful march in Selma, Alabama in 1965 that helped turn public opinion and pave the way for passage of the Voting Rights Act just a few months later. 
Lewis didn't need to get his hands dirty with politics. Given his experience, his story, he could have remained an activist on the outside, and he could have been very successful. But he decided that the best way to advance the cause of justice was to get involved and to be pragmatic. Throughout his career in the House, he has been called the conscience of the Congress. As recently as last summer, he led his colleagues in a sit-in protest on the House floor to call for legislation to stem gun violence. Lewis didn't check his activist approach at the door, but he's taken up the role of the pragmatist by working through the system. And he's done so without losing his moral center. That inspired me, that he could work from the inside and compromise without losing his moral clarity. I decided that's the kind of per public servant I wanted to be. And that's what I've strived for ever since. I started out working on campaigns. I did door-to-door -door fundraising and ultimately found my niche in opposition research. Now, my guess is if you've heard anything about opposition research, it hasn't been anything good. So you might be wondering, how does he talk about maintaining his moral way and then fall into digging up dirt on political opponents? Well, it's a little complicated. First, I didn't see it as digging up dirt. I highlighted votes, quotes, official acts, and campaign dollars taken. I never dug in dumpsters. I didn't work with PIs or tail people or traffic and lies and innuendo. Everything I produced as a researcher was sourced to publicly available materials. Second, there are lines. It's not personal. It's not about someone's family, and it's got to be about official actions. As a public official, you serve the people, and you can and should be held accountable for your actions and your positions. And third, I saw it as a means to an end. The only way to succeed on a policy level was by winning at the ballot box. I certainly contributed to the loss of civility in our society by engaging in negative campaigning. But I felt that given the stakes, a little rough and tumble was worth it. I'll admit, there were times in the heat of battle when I got too caught up in wanting to win, when I got a little personal, or I pushed a line. And those were comprom compromises that I made with my better self. I'll give you a story. During the 2006 election, I worked for the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee, which is a party committee devoted to winning house races. I worked for the committee's independent expenditure team, which set up shop in our own office across the street and put together negative advertising against Republican candidates around the country. I have to admit, it was a blast. One of the ads that I was most proud of was against a candidate in Iowa named Jeff Lamberti. I'd found that when he was in the state legislature, he'd voted for a bill that allowed hog lots, which are major industrial hog farms, to be allowed to be set up within it as close as 500 feet from a river or a stream. The waste generated on these farms is massive, and it raises a legitimate issue about whether 500 feet was enough of a buffer not to pollute the water. So our ad makers put together a fantastic ad. It featured a young girl, probably six years old, drinking a glass of water as we described this photo. And then the images of the hogs kind of were superimposed in the background. It was powerful. When the dust settled, Jeff Lamberti lost. Democrats took back control of the House for the first time since 1994, and I was ecstatic. A few days later, I was talking to my best friend from college, who had come from Iowa. And I was talking up this ad and how proud I was of it, and he informed me that his mom had actually seen it during the election. What did she think, I asked. She absolutely hated it, she responded. She was a dyed-in-the-wool Democrat just like me, but she thought it had gone too far. That punctured my pride and made me think long and hard about my role in the political process. But I came to the same conclusion. It was a compromise with my better self, but it was worth doing because it paved the way for Congress to do important work. At the time, my chief political concern was the war in Iraq. With the Republican-controlled Congress, there was very little to check the Bush administration's approach, which amounted to more troops, more wasted American resources, and more dead and wounded soldiers and civilians. 
about nine months after the, that election, which had flipped control of both the House and Senate to the Democrats, I started as Deputy Research Director for Senate Majority Leader Harry Reid. I started on a Friday and was informed that the Senate Democrats were planning an all-night debate over the Iraq War the following week. To prepare, I spent the entire weekend with two other staffers filling binder after binder, 52, full of newspaper articles, fact sheets, and other materials so that senators be able to have plenty of material to hold the floor all night. When the big day came and Senate staff started rolling cots in off the Senate floor, it was electric. News coverage was wall to wall, and it felt like we were finally breaking through. Support for the war was eroding, and over the next year and a half, I worked with my fellow staffers to support the Senate's effort to bring, bring about an end to the war. I was proud of the work. I also had the opportunity to work on President Obama's 2008 campaign, and then spent three years working in the White House. In the White House, the nature of compromise was truly laid bare. Most clearly through the passage of the Affordable Care Act, which is, of course, still a source of ongoing debate. As someone who labored long and hard fighting for passage of the law, I'm immensely proud that we were able to expand access to health care for millions of Americans who couldn't previously afford coverage. But so much of what we wanted to achieve was let go in the service of getting something done. No single payer, no public option, no government negotiation to lower drug prices. We made concession after concession in hopes we could attract some Republican support that never materialized. I was also on the team that helped review the records of potential Supreme Court nominees and then helped the nominee through the confirmation process. One of the judges I reviewed was Sonia Sotomayor, now the nation's first Latina Supreme Court justice. Immediately following her nomination, conservatives attacked her, arguing that despite her education at Princeton and Yale Law, she wasn't intellectually up to the job. They also tried to claim that she was racist for arguing that minority women judges would better understand certain issues around race and gender than their white male colleagues. And they claimed she was un-American for saying her name with a Hispanic pronunciation. I'd spent weeks researching her background, learning her remarkable story, and reading her smart, well-reasoned opinions. I cared deeply about her confirmation and wanted to call this for what I saw it as political gamesmanship, and racism. But a full-throated response isn't always the best way to win a confirmation fight. We pushed back, but we pulled our punches, knowing that we needed 60 senators to vote yes to get her confirmed. Then Judge Sotomayor spent weeks holding meetings with individual senators, some of, the, some of whom were the very same that had called her a racist. She held her own during her hearings and was ultimately confirmed 68 to 31 making it one of the more partisan votes on a Supreme Court nominee in history. But it was deeply frustrating that we couldn't just call it what it was. Now, in the Attorney General's office, I face different types of compromises. When a company breaks the law, when should we prosecute to the fullest extent, and when should we settle? The calculation often comes down to resources. If this is the case to which we want to devote attorney time, or if our attorneys could do more to protect Pennsylvanians on another case. In all of these ways, I've made compromises, but I remain committed to the work, to making our society fairer, safer, more just, and more prosperous for those who need it most. I think part of the reason why is that as a pragmatist, I have no illusions that we're ever going to arrive at the end of the struggle. There will always be challenges, but there will also always be a morality in staying in the fight and doing the work. A few years after leaving GFS, I had a massive argument with one of my high school friends. He was an activist, and he was frankly appalled at the choices that I'd made to engage in politics. I, in turn, found his absolutism naive and unworkable. We argued for a long time without getting anywhere. And maybe that's the point. Neither side is right because each side needs the other. So as you all decide how to engage with the world, remember that it's not an either or choice between activism and pragmatism. It takes both. Thank you.
So happy to take any questions anybody has. Yeah. No questions. Oh, we've got one question. Diane. What would be a highlight for you? I know you named a number, but is there any particular highlight recently of your work in our general office something that you share in addition to what you have? Yeah. I'm our work in the, attorney, in the Attorney General's office is just getting started. Um, I've only been there nine months. Uh, the new Attorney General has only been there nine months. But we've already done some big things. The thing that I'm most excited about is, and I think that's most impactful, um, is addressing the opioid crisis that we're facing right now. Um, this thing is, is massive. It's killing 13 Pennsylvanians every day. And you know, we've launched a major investigation. We're helping to lead a major investigation into the role of the pharmaceutical companies and the distributors. So I think that's the, uh, one of the most impactful things. Um, the other thing, frankly, is this is, it's been an interesting time to be a uh, Democratic Attorney General, given what's happening in the federal level. And it's been, um, it's still very early yet, but we've certainly taken a number of actions in court um, to check some of the, what we think are illegal actions of the Trump administration. And, I've been excited to be a part of that and interested to see where it all goes. Obviously, the courts have to rule before we can sort of make a definitive statement, but it's exciting to be a part of. Absolutely. <laughs> Uh, I think the question was sort of how did my experience in high school interacting with my peers and I assume faculty as well um, make me suited to public service? And I, I think that so much of GFS education of kind of being in debate with one another in constant conversation really helped me um, be prepared to be able to kind of have tough arguments, tough conversations but have them in a, in a non-personal way and in a way that um, moves the ball forward. So I think that's the, the biggest way that I, what I got from my peers. Oh, yes? What was your best moment at GFS? Ooh. <laughs> oh no. It's, it's a tough one. It was probably um, either right here on this stage, singing a cappella and choir, or on the stage back there at Coffee House where we had an absolutely unlistenable band, but it was so much fun. <laughs> we just cleared the room. <laughs> yes? So I'm not sure how involved you can be in this area, but what steps do you have to take towards fixing the reason that you are in a better crisis and how Absolutely. So we're, we're working on that in the Attorney General's office. Sorry, the question was, uh, what are we doing to deal with the heroin and opioid crisis that's going on in Pennsylvania and across the country? And the Attorney General's office, we're approaching it from a number of different levels. The Attorney General believes in taking a multidisciplinary approach, and so we're trying to really focus on getting treatment for the people that need treatment. One of the biggest things we've done is we're trying to expand, change a law that will expand treatment for those on Medicaid pretty drastically. Um, we're also doing enforcement. Um, we have a, about 300 agents who are out there targeting dealers of this stuff. Um, we've really focused on the, the issue of diversion because 80% of new heroin users actually start by abusing prescription drugs. So we're, we're focused on the diversion of prescription drugs from legal purposes to illegal purposes. And we've increased by 50% our arrests on that. And then we're trying to raise public awareness. We do a lot of public education and outreach on this. So we're, we're trying to do it at a lot of different levels. And the last piece is that big, uh, there's a major multi-state investigation. It's 41 states working together. And we're one of the leaders on it looking at the role of the pharmaceutical industry and whether they broke any laws as they've sort of expanded the amount of, of these opioid pills that they sell and distribute every year. Yes? You know the um, increased hyperpartisanship in Washington? 
So the question was, what are the solutions to hyperpartisanship in Washington? You know, it's a big one. Uh, one of the things is stopping gerrymandering. And there was a suit um, that just came before the Supreme Court against Wisconsin's map. And gerrymandering is when politicians write boundaries so that essentially one party gets very few seats and the other party gets a ton of seats. And Pennsylvania is a great example. We're about a 50-50 state when it comes to presidential elections, Senate elections, governor's elections. So roughly half of us are Democrats, half of us are Republicans in the state. And yet, our congressional map, we have 18 congressmen, 13 of them are Republican and five are Democrat. And that's because Republicans made a map that packed as many Democratic voters into the five districts as possible and then gave them an advantage in all the other districts. Wisconsin did something similar. There is a suit against it that just went to the Supreme Court. Um, the oral arguments were pretty positive for folks like me who support redistricting reform. And so I think that would be a big, big goal. Beyond that, I mean, some of this is you know, electing leaders who are committed to moving the ball forward, to being pragmatists um, on both sides. I think about Susan Collins in Maine, who is a really constructive member of the Senate. She's not name calling. She's not grandstanding. She's trying to do something for her constituents. And I think if we elect more of those leaders, that's going to make a big difference. Yes. Well, I think it's more evident, the question was, how has being a pragmatist moved my career, been able to help me in my career and maybe help me back in my career? And my answer is that it really was my choice of career more than anything else. Um, had I been more strictly the activist approach, I would have wanted to stay outside government. I would have stayed in advocacy. And instead, because I'm a pragmatist, I chose to go inside. And my view is that you know, the people on the inside are the ones that have to make decisions and have the opportunity to make decisions. Um, and I wanted to be at the decision-making table. So that's what, why I went that way. Uh, yes? I, th I think the question was, if I had the opportunity to eliminate the two-party system, would I? Um, that's an interesting question. I, I'm not sure how it would work practically. You'd have to change a lot of the laws about how our uh, elections are run because first past the post elections are kind of inevitably going to produce a two-party system. But if we did that, it's an interesting, uh, uh, interesting idea. We're going to see how that plays out in California where they've changed that law. And I think we can judge from there. I um, think that's about it. But that. Special thank you to David and to the questions. What great questions. Um, great fodder for conversation. Thank you, David, for joining us today. We're going to do two things. Uh, I'd like to close with a moment of silent reflection, and then after that, Tom Myron has some announcements, so we're going to stay put. So let, why don't we settle into some silent reflection, please? Thank you. Thank you. Tom, do you want to come? I uh, just want to, uh, I hope you'll, you'll uh, join me in congratulating the Girls Forest Cross Country team who finished second that day, the Girls JV team who won, uh, came in first yesterday, the Boys JV team that came in first yesterday, and the Boys Forest Cross Country team that Came in first yesterday at the Friends League Championships. With those athletes, honors, can you 